All right, how's it going y'all? Today we're back in DSM-7, and this time we're actually gonna show how to fully install DSM-7 beta from scratch. I basically completely factory reset a NAS that I've been using for testing, and we're just going to set up the entire process. Honestly, I thought this would be interesting to see how they changed it, and so I figured other people would as well. So this is the process. I'm gonna go through some of the best practices just in case you're interested, but we're mostly gonna look at how to install DSM-7 on a Synology NAS. All right, and so before we get into this tutorial, I've gotta do my usual, hey, DSM-7 is in a beta. It's probably fine to install, though I would not. Honestly, unless you really need one of the features that DSM-7 has, it's probably not worth the risk for you to install on your Synology just because you really don't know what's gonna happen. Anything can happen in a beta, and that's why it's a beta. So that's my two cents. If you are going to install it, just know it is at risk and make sure to have good backups and really be okay with the fact that there's a chance that all your data could become corrupt. It's very, very, very low, but the chance is real. If you're running a Synology that's mission critical, unless you really need one of those features, I just would not touch it. Wait the maybe six months I would assume is the maximum amount of time we'll be in beta and then install it. That way you know all the bugs have been worked out and things like that. Otherwise, it's tough. All right, well now that I've done my spiel, let's go ahead and get started. I've already gone to find.synology.com and it's found the new NAS. And look, it's already got a static IP address because I've set up my router to have a static IP address on this device. So even though it's a completely blank device, my router knows the MAC address and therefore goes, okay, I'll assign it this address. All right, and so let's just go ahead and click connect. Yada, 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 sign away my life. And so now we're gonna go ahead and set up our DSM 718 plus. By the way, that's what I'm gonna be installing this on. And so I'm actually going to be installing a .pat file from my computer. This is actually how I'm gonna be running DSM 7 on here, is I've downloaded the DSM.pat file. And I'll leave a link to that in the description below. But I also showed how to set all of this up in my DSM 7 virtual machine tutorial. And I'll leave a link to both that and this in the description below. So I'm just gonna go ahead and browse to it. And it's on my desktop. And we're just gonna go ahead and select that .pat file and choose for upload. And it's going to erase the drives, I understand that. And now, it's just gonna go ahead and do it. This is gonna take a few minutes, so I'm not gonna make you sit through it. All right, but I'll see you in a few minutes. All right, and so now it's finally over. So now we're gonna go ahead and start up DSM-7. So first off, we've got to set up a device name and an admin account. And for this, I'll just call the admin account Will. Though I would recommend doing something like Will Admin and having a completely separate admin account than your regular account. This way you only log in with the admin account when you need to and never over SMB. This really limits your possibility of getting cryptoed because if a computer on the network gets cryptoed, they're not going to get admin privileges on your NAS. Basically, you could set up BTRFS snapshots and only the admin could restore them or delete them. That way, if you were to get cryptoed, at worst, they'd basically encrypt all your folders via a computer connected to it over SMB. Then later on, you as the admin, using your uncompromised admin privileges, would be able to go in and restore the entire thing from a snapshot. After, of course, you've taken care of whatever crypto and everything, then you'd be able to restore and not lose any data. I'm actually planning on going through a full tutorial on how to limit the possibility of getting cryptoed. But back to this, I'm just gonna throw something the other. All right, and so actually for this, I'm actually going to sign in with my Synology account because we really wanna be able to see everything that Synology has to offer. And I'm going to enable both Synology Active Insight and backing up my Synology account regularly, just because these are some great new features with Synology DSM-7 that we want to be able to see. All right, and just like that, that was quick. It's already got us up and running, and it's even walking us through and saying, hey, let's create a storage pool in volume. This is so much easier than it was on DSM-6, because I remember back when I had no idea what a Synology was or really what a NAS was, and I had my first, this actual NAS, I had a lot of trouble getting up and running and trying to understand how to get files on it. And so actually I wanna follow through and just see what it directs us to do. So we're just gonna go ahead and click create now. 
And just like that, it's got this wizard that helps us walk through how to set up a volume. This is a thing that I think Synology was really lacking earlier because there was no easy way to really walk people through who didn't really know what they were doing, how to get the thing up and running. And I'm really glad they started that. And it even says basically what we're gonna be doing here. All right, and for raid type, it tells us everything we need to know. For this, I'm actually just gonna have a basic because I'm only gonna be setting up one drive for this. Basically, basic is just like every other drive. You've got one drive, it's a drive, it's its own thing. And for that, I'm gonna be using a smaller one because I've got some future tutorials I wanna show. And then, as you can see, I've actually already set this up within DSM-7 before, so we're just gonna go ahead and click continue. And I'm actually gonna skip this drive check just because, well, I've already installed DSM-7 on here before and it's already been checked and it's not a permanent NAS. And so we're gonna be allocating our volume capacity. Unless you've got something very special going on, just do max. And I'm gonna be choosing BTRFS. All right, and click apply. All right, and so that was really easy. You can tell Synology's put a lot of thought into this and really trying to make sure that people understand how to get their volume set up and running from the start. Honestly, it was not easy when I first started and they've done a great job of making this a lot simpler for people who just want to be able to set up their NAS quick and don't want to go into all the minutia. And so if you look right here, it also sees that there is configuration backups from my Synology account. This was from when I actually set this up earlier, but we're not going to restore from this now. But it's cool that they've got that set up and they make it so easy and they even find it for you. All right, and so just like that, we've got a volume up and running and it told us to do that. All right, and so now we're going to pop into control panel and we're going to finish up and we're going to add a shared folder because it did not have the wizard have us do that, but that makes a little bit more sense. I probably should have checked the help menu and saw if that walked us through it, but I did not. And so here it's, and so here under create, it's got two options. We can either mount a hybrid share folder or create a shared folder. That hybrid share is a video all on its own, but it essentially allows you to have some of your stuff in the cloud, the majority of your stuff in the cloud, and then only files that you need locally, store locally. Then if you try to access a file over SMB or something that's in the cloud, it'll just go ahead and download it and then give it to you. It is gonna be slow for that, but if you're in a realistic world like an office environment, probably like 80 to 90% of the files on the file system over time are just not used by everyone. And so you can have specific offices only download the parts of the file system that they need from the cloud. This is really geared toward multi-office environments who wanna go all in on Synology's plan. But for those people, this actually might make a ton of sense because you'll be able to have satellite branches who only need to have their specific files downloaded and still have access to all the other files across the entire network. I'm really interested to try this out, but this is definitely gonna be its own video. So we're just gonna go ahead and click create shared folder. And we're gonna give it a name. We'll call it first. BTRFS, yada, yada, yada. I'm not going to encrypt it. And I'm definitely gonna set up checksums because checksums are a huge great thing about BTRFS and it's got quotas. All right. And it's pretty similar to how it's been. If we go into file services, we can also see that they've already enabled SMB and AFP. Um, I'm actually wondering how long they're gonna keep AFP going because it's really not that helpful and Mac has left it and I think everybody's honestly just moving on to SMB. Even though SMB has its issues, I think it's basically just what everybody's gonna be using in a few years because it's the only thing that works across all the levels reliably. That is Mac, PC, and Linux. And so now we'll go back and we'll create a new user. And that's gonna be that user we're gonna set up that's completely separate than our admin account. This way we have a separate account that is not an admin account that we use all the time. That means if this account got compromised, which is fairly likely, especially if you got a virus on your computer, then it would not have admin privileges, meaning we could use the uncompromised admin account to restore everything, assuming we set up snapshots. And I'll go through and show you how to do that really quickly here too. And so we're just gonna go ahead and click create and we'll just call this will as opposed to will admin and we'll give it a password. And it's 
going to be set up as a user account, not an administrator. And we're going to give them read write access to that first account and unlimited quota. And we're going to allow all of these services, except for the ones we are definitely not going to need. All right, and so now we've got this new account. So let's just go ahead and connect right to it. If we look in file services, it's already told us how to connect easily. So we're just gonna go ahead and copy this and do it. It's gonna say connect. And just like that, it's already worked. It's actually because I've already set up the account on here and it just remembered it from last time because I used the same name and password. Um, but yeah, it worked immediately and it's even got that recycling bin. So we can just copy files to it just like any other thing and it's just going to send on over. Now say we delete it. It's gonna go in the recycling bin, but because we checked only give administrators access to the recycling bin, we're not gonna see it, which is both good and bad depending on how your office or home is set up. In some ways it's great because then it can't get deleted out of the recycling bin and only an administrator can recover it. And that way nothing too bad happens, but it's also bad because that means somebody has to contact IT to get something fixed. So it depends on how your office is set up and how much you're worried about bad things happening because users tend to be able to do the worst things you never know. So that is a option you can choose between. If we go into our user account, I'm still sat in Dennis admin here. So if we look in recycle, we can see that it is right there. And so I would be able to recover it and just send it back into the main file. And now my user here will be able to see it again. And so it's really easy to restore that and just really quick and easy. All right, so now let's just go into package center and we're going to install snapshot replication. And I do like how they call it join beta to make sure you know it's a beta version. This is beta, 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 beta to make sure that you know this is not the release version. So you should expect that bad things might happen and not use it on production ass. I know it's completely overkill and they're really hitting it home, but I think it is really important because you don't want people going, oh, look, there's a new update out. I'm just going to download it and expect it to work perfectly. So now we've installed snapshots and we're just going to go ahead and open it up. And so now we're going to set up snapshots and snapshots are a great feature. They're only found in BTRFS shares. So now we're going to go ahead and set up snapshots and we're going to go into settings right here and we're going to set up a snapshot schedule. We, we can select days to run. So that means you can say, okay, I only want to run it on weekdays. So every week, weekday starting at midnight, we're going to do a snapshot every hour and then we'll stop it at midnight or we can stop it when everybody's off work at like, seven. So you can choose when to do that. Probably six to seven is not an awful idea. That is not seven. This is seven. And so now basically you can have a snapshot of every single hour and choose the retention policy. We're going to set up a smart retention, which basically has snapshots, keep all snapshots for one day. Basically I'll have all of today's snapshots. I'll do today and yesterday and we'll do the latest hourly snapshot for 24 hours, and then the latest daily snapshot maybe every 14 days, and then the snapshot of the week for probably five weeks, and then the latest snapshot for, of the month for 12 months, and maybe two years. It really depends on what your file system is like and how much data you have. Snapshots are very thin, but if a lot of people are adding and deleting files, they will start to fill up very quickly because deleting doesn't actually delete. By having the latest snapshot of the year for two years, we basically have almost all the data from the past two years, even if it's been deleted. It is more or less deduplicated with BTRFS's copy on write, but that is not perfect. And so it could really fill up and you may have to go through and clean this out. I would recommend running it with a larger retention policy and then if you find data starts to pile up and you just don't need these snapshots, you can start deleting the old ones and basically setting up a more aggressive retention policy that has fewer snapshots saved. It's really up to just what you need. 
And then finally, if we go into advanced, this is the big one, make snapshots visible. So this is where you can allow users to go through and restore and look at their own snapshots. And we're going to go ahead and enable it. And so now it's just going to run for us. We're going to have snapshots and we can even take one now. Then we go down to replication. Replication is actually what allows you to send it to another volume or even another Synology NAS. But we're not going to set that up because we do not have a remote NAS right now. Though I will be doing another video on this most certainly. All right, and so now let's test out our snapshots. So we just took a manual snapshot of that volume. So now let's go ahead and delete this folder. So now it's gone. We'll say I really needed access to that. And for whatever reason, it's not in the recycling bin. Or even a better example of this is, say I altered a text file. Oh wait, I've now corrupted it. I now hate the change. And for whatever reason, I need to go back to that previous version. Recycling bin's not gonna help you. A modification is not a delete. So it's not gonna have it in the recycling bin, where it is gonna have it in the snapshots. So it'll say the snapshot, and it'll show you the exact file system at that time. This is really impressive, and this is a user's option. I'm just curious what's gonna happen if I hit delete on here. And good, it does not allow us to delete things. This is a really great feature because now users can just grab files out of here and be able to see old copies of their data without being able to modify any of it. This means that there's very little likelihood that they're going to break anything because they can only grab, they cannot delete. So this is why snapshots is a huge benefit for businesses. Honestly, having the ability to open this up for your employees to browse old versions of files without having to go through a huge HR process, finding the right person who's got the admin access to the Synology, who can go through and recover the account, is going to save a ton of time in the long run. And so that's how snapshots work. Me as the admin can also go in and go into recovery and basically click recover. And I'm going to either restore to the snapshot, basically set up the shared folder the way it was at this time, or clone with a new name. So we can just create a new shared folder in line and we'll give myself access to it and just be able to go. And now it is a recovered folder. And so now we basically have a point in time with exactly how that folder was whenever we set it up. It's really great for this. I am really impressed by how snapshots work all without taking up that much space too. All right, and so that's snapshots for you. I just really want to do a video on this because I think DSM-7 has made it a lot more clear. And it's something I think most people should set up at first. I'm planning on doing a full on, hey, here's how you want to set up a Synology for business video. But this is just one of the big things I don't think a lot of people install, even though it's a huge benefit. All right, well, that's going to be it for this video. Go ahead and leave any other tutorials you'd like to see me make in the comments below. And if you'd like to hire me, there's a hire me button, first link. All right, well, that's it. Have a good one. Bye.